Praise the Lord, everyone. It is a good, good old uh, Sunday afternoon here in the city of Baltimore, Maryland, and yours truly, Mac and Myra, greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you guys for all the support that you give us on Facebook Live, and some of you come over to uh, YouTube. I actually owe you a couple of videos uh, that I haven't uh, put up yet, but I'm just excited as always to be able to share space with the woman whom God gave me. And unlike <laughs> Adam, I'm not complaining about it. I actually <laughs> like it. <laughs> so um, we do greet you with uh, the joy of the Lord because the joy of the Lord, as the Bible tells us, is our strength. We're not going to prolong uh, the moment. Uh, if you're looking at the title of this, uh, today's word is forgiveness. Mm. And this one was submitted by the one who I fell in love with, Myra herself. And we are going to address this mm. word I haven't looked at a thing that she has written about it, and I'm just noticing I need to go grab what I've written about it. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, we pray that when you come away from this experience, you will have heard every type of way that forgiveness could be defined, whether we're talking about God's way of defining it, Christ's way of defining it, the way the Holy Spirit helps us to experience forgiveness, how we should be forgiving one to another, how love is an integral part of all of this uh, word that we define and call out as forgiveness. And all of that is relevant, and I'm just so excited. I know she is. It's her word. So she's already told me, I've got seven pages of words here. So uh, we're, we're going to see where those uh, seven pages take us, and we'll take it from there. And there you go, darling. You can um, well, lead us in. I'm going to go grab uh, my cheat sheet a little bit, but you can get started. Okay. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for each opportunity you give us to show forth your love through the Word of God, because it truly is love, even though love can hurt sometimes. But it's because we need to be laid bare so that we can actually love the way we should in the name of Christ. And for His sake, we, we come before you confessing our sin, and asking you to forgive us as you have forgiven us so many times before. But we know that we just still walk in that. And it's not true. Because we are not, no, we are no longer sinners. We are loved. And we are walking in his love. If we would just turn around and, and look to him and not look to the things that make us respond in ways that are not loving. So thank you, Lord, for for giving us that one time that should last for, for eternity, but how we use it and abuse it. But help us, Father, through your spirit to understand the truth of your forgiveness that is forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, forgiveness can be a, a very heavy thing to think about, whether we're asking it for someone else or desiring it from others who hurt us. But it can also be incredibly healing and powerful. We need to look at forgiveness from a Christian perspective. I think we've been walking around looking at it from a worldly and carnal perspective because we say, we say things like, I'm going to forgive because I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to forget. That's a caveat. That's not, that's not in the Bible. It's nowhere. The Bible has a lot to say about forgiveness and repentance from the words of the Psalms to those that Jesus had spoke, spoke in the Gospels, telling of God's forgiveness of man, removing our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. And that's found in Psalms 103, 12. 
It says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And that's something we need to remember. And he's not remembering our sins anymore. In Hebrews 10, 17, it talks about, For by one offering he hath perfected his offering of his life forever, them that are sanctified. And that's us. We've been sanctified. Way of the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Not only our heart, but our mind need to be renewed from the so-called wisdom or better yet, the foolishness of this world. Because when people talk about forgiveness, a lot of times it's, it's coming out of their hurt, but it's not coming out of the Word of God. In Matthew 18, uh, 22, Peter, you know, Peter the impetuous Peter, he, he came to Christ and he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Can you hear the impertinence and it's like, Give me a number. And then from that point on, I can do whatever I feel like. Just give me a number. <laughs> there has to be a limit. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, which is innumerable. He's not telling him a specific number. He's telling them that we continue to forgive. And then in Matthew, uh, Jesus continues with the story about the 10,000 talents, debt, 10,000 talents in these days and age, that would be probably millions of dollars. Debt that a servant was forgiven by the king himself because the king had compassion on him. He, got, he said, you know, you're going to have to pay this back. And he said, no, our children, I pleaded. He pleaded with the king and the king said, out of compassion, he forgave him. This enormous debt. And then what did the servant do? As soon as he walked out, he saw a fellow servant, someone at, at his own level, that owed him a hundred denarius, which is much less than his debt was to the king. And not only did he tell him, you know, you owe me money, he, he manhandled him, he grabbed him, he treated him roughly. The king didn't do that to him. But he treated this man worse than the king had treated him. And then he threw him in jail. But you know what? When we go against the things of God, it comes up. I mean, he didn't hide it. It was out in public, so people saw it. So, of course, they went back to the king. And the king, his master, like our master and lord, he chastised him. He told him but he, because he didn't have any compassion on his fellow servant. He had him tortured. Now that, that was interesting. He didn't just throw him in jail. He had him tortured until he repaid his debt. Because it wasn't just, I'm going to put you in jail. No, I'm going to torture you because what you <laughs> did was much worse than I would have done to you. And you're going to treat somebody worse than you were treated for the things that you did. But you're going to be brutal with someone else. He had him tortured. The conclusion in Matthew 18, 35, so my heavenly father, this is our father, also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And who is our brother? It's not necessarily a brother in Christ. Because we are all brothers under the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we don't know what the potential of that other person he may become a brother in Christ, but he's a fellow human being, and he's not looking at him. He's not a respective person because he might not be saved. It doesn't say because he's not saved you have to, you know, you, you shouldn't forgive him. He says, no, you forgive him his trespasses. Because what was the servant thinking when he did that? 
to be so unforgiven after he had been forgiven. And that's us. We've all been forgiven. So why aren't we more forgiving of others? Because the fruit of forgiveness is love. Mac mentioned that. Love is part of this. In Luke, mm -hmm. we see a woman who the Bible says out right out front, she's a sinner. She's living a life that is so ungodly. But she came with her alabaster box to anoint Jesus. But she came in the midst of this uh, assembly of godly men, uh, Pharisees, men that know the word, men who are uh, esteemed in the, in the community because of their so-called relationship with the Lord. The men who walk around with, with uh, symbols and signs that proclaim that I am a man of God. But when she came in to anoint Jesus, to cry over him, to wash his feet with her tears, abject humility, and, a, and adoration, the atmosphere was hostile and judgmental against her. Why? Because she's a sinner. How dare she? He was thinking that. And as Jesus is, you know, he's hearing the thoughts, especially of Simon, because he approached Simon. He actually spoke to him specifically. You know, what do you think of this? He tells him a story. He starts to tell Simon this story about also two debtors who owe 550 denarii. One is a large amount, one is, is, is different, but they owed these two different amounts respectfully. But they were both forgiven. And he asked Simon, tell me therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon says, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus says, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. And that's the expression that she was showing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That she loved him so much. That she is valuable. Alabaster box with this perfume that was very costly. It, it might have cost a year's wages. Even though the wages were of sin. It was still wages. It was, it was valuable. And she was willing to give that to her, her Lord and Savior. For she loved much, but to whom little is given, the same loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. So no sin is too great to be forgiven. We can't, we can't judge people on a scale. They did this or they did that. It's, not, it's, it's nowhere in there. As far as the sin that they, that they, they, you know, that they did, and who do we truly love more? You know, when we love someone, we actually possibly open up the potential for them to understand the love of Christ. It's not us. It's not us that's forgiving them. It's it's the Spirit working in us. It's our mind being renewed, and that's the potential. That may be opening up for these people to understand the forgiveness of Christ because of ourselves we can't do it. If you read Peter, First Peter, and in this instance Peter has matured. He's he has learned a lot. He has seen a lot, and he says, "Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind." Here we go with that mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. Because when we think about forgiveness, it's not so much our heart. Our heart should be tender anyway. But the mind says, well, we start reasoning. Well, so it says, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the form of lust, which is basically the world, as in your ignorance, but as he called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. 
because it's written, be holy for I am holy. That's another excuse. Well, I, you know, I, I couldn't help it. You know, they did this, they hurt me. I'm only human. But it says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to brought to you the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. He who called you is holy. You also be holy in your conduct. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the, the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers. Hmm. Because some of that is heredity. You see your fathers perform one way and because their fathers perform. And then when you do the same thing, our children follow after. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Because that's how we were saved. If our fathers weren't saved, but we are, we don't look to their example. We look to the the spirit of the living Lord that's living within us to determine our conduct. It's not, when it's, we're not talking like, oh, this is so high. Right? It's talking about conduct. How we respond, how we walk the talk. It's our conduct that we're talking about. And in, in, in a lot of instances, family is a good example. Because that's, you know, that's where our heart has been broken a lot. And that's somewhere in, in, in some instances where we don't respond as well. Sometimes we're nicer to other people than we are within our families. Because hurts and disappointments. And it, it just, you know. But it talks about the wives to be submissive and chaste in her conduct. That even if she's with an unbeliever that. She may win him with her gentle and quiet spirit, trusting in God, do good, and not be afraid of any terror. Afraid of what? What? It might be, well, if I'm nice to my husband, even though he's not nice to me, what will my friends think? The girl, if he talked to me like that, girl, you better get him straight, girl. Or somebody else's opinion. If I was in that house, he wouldn't talk to me that way. He wouldn't do that. But God doesn't say that. He says, you would be gentle and quiet women. And what does it say about the husband? Be understanding. Honor her. And it doesn't say too much for the husband. It gives a lot of definitions for the women. Because we know women, we we go a lot of different areas. And we... Men are more compartmentalized. Compartment, com, now you got me messing up. <laughs> compartmentalized. Yeah. They're not as complicated as we are. But it says the husband should be understanding, honor her. But then it goes on and says, but both the heirs together of the grace of life. That's, that's the husband. Talking about the husband. But the husband with the wife are heirs together of the grace of life. It says, let not your prayers be hindered. Joint heirs. It doesn't say that with the wives because the husband's responsible for that. He's the one that leads. Because in Romans 8, 17, it talks about we're joint heirs with Christ. So that if we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Because that's part of of this life and the suffering comes in a lot in the relationships especially within our families within our marriages but look at that the word to the husband both are heirs so the husband understands and honors his wife and he knows that they're both together heirs of the grace of life that's his mantle to include her in. And that's her to see. Ooh, this man is honoring me and 
calling me in with him together. So if he does something I don't like, God, help me to forgive him. If he messes up, help me to forgive him. And it, it, it hurts my heart so much because I've seen in some instances some marriages that are just totally broken. Not so much because of what the husband did, but because the wife won't forgive. I'm sure there are instances where the hus the wives have done something and the husbands won't forgive. But in my experiences, it's always been the husband has done something and the wife won't forgive. And then even some of the husbands have asked for forgiveness and are walking in a, in, in a good manner. The wife won't forgive. Oh, that hurts me so much. And I go like, what would I do? I pray that I would do exactly what I'm reading, what I'm hearing the Word of God saying, but not so much on the written Word and the, on the page, but in my mind and in my heart, that I would respond in a way that glorify God. Because we're all called to be to a blessing. We're called to be a blessing. Finally, it says, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, sisters, family. Be tenderhearted, courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. We, it comes back to us. Because in, back to Romans 8, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's part of that forgiveness. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the spirit. Because it maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He hasn't left us. He's making intercession for us. To help us to walk the walk and talk the talk and live. And then that beautiful scripture, we, we, you say that, but we have to think about it in context. But we know all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But that doesn't mean that it's a perfect world. Everything is going to be roses. But it works to good for the Father. If it works so good for the Father, then we're at peace. Because it comes back to us. There are consequences if we don't adhere to the Word. Because we need to, to renew our spiritual vitality. In Hebrews 12 it says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down in feeble knees. Like, what can I do? What shall I do? And make stress straight paths for your feet. Go! Go where you need to go, and that's to him. So that what is lame, what is so painful and so hurtful, may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Those are consequences. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble mm. and by this many become defiled that unforgiveness doesn't just destroy yourself or ourselves it destroys people around us it gives out an aroma that is foul a sensation that is is like creepy like ooh. And it can be contagious because who hasn't been hurt? Who hasn't walked in pain? Mark talks about 11, talks about forgiveness and prayer. And whenever you stay in praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Now we're standing before the Lord. We're not standing before the person. This is before God. It says, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Because we're sinning when we don't forgive. That is a sin. We're sinning when we don't forgive. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven.
forgive your trespasses. We cannot continue to say, I forgive, but I will not forget. Because you haven't forgiven. Ephesians talks about being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Because when we're walking that talk and we're, we're looking at our conduct, not just outwardly, but inwardly, we're being renewed in the spirit of our mind. And we're putting on that new man, which was created according to God. We were not born this way. We were created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And I'm going to end with Lamentations because there's always hope. Mm -hmm. Lamentations 3, 21, 23. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Mm. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. 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 All right. Well, I tell you. <laughs> um, you know, I never know how to kick these things off. I just ought to just get right to it. Um when I looked at this word forgiveness, um, I wanted to make sure that I was considering God's perspective because we can talk about what it means to us mm -hmm. all day long, but um, we have demonstrations in the Holy Word of God showing forgiveness sometimes it might be defined as mercy mm -hmm. um you know um I, I think at the core of all of this i think oftentimes we find ourselves thinking of our own selves too highly mm -hmm. than we ought to and so from god's perspective None of us deserves forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, in a funny way, uh, not so dissimilar to salvation, it's one of the greatest gifts that God has given. You know, forgiveness wraps itself up in love mm -hmm. um, and it wraps itself up in mercy and even in grace. And we, you know, go through life and we have our definition of what forgiveness is because we think that, okay, just because maybe we've stopped, uh, you know, addressing a particular issue. But like Myra said earlier, you know, we had that mentality, um, well, I forgive you, but I'll never forget. <laughs> well... I do recall that even God himself uh, cast away the record, the record that should have sent us all to damnation. Mm -hmm. He, you know, in the songs that, you know, they say that he cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. In other words, I, I don't think that God could ever truly forget per se. But what it does mean is that that issue is off the table. It's not brought up again five years, 10 years, 30 <laughs> years later. You know, it, it is the, the slate is clean. When God gave us his most precious gift, which was the gift of forgiveness through Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, we, we read uh, John 3, 16, but I believe John 3, 17, he did not come into this world to condemn us, but that uh, the world through him might, keyword, might be saved. And so the, the thing that changes that from will be saved to might be saved is us. 
And how we react to the demonstration of forgiveness that was displayed on the cross. And we sing songs like, you know, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. But what are we really sacrificing? <laughs> Is it the beginning of a football game? Is it, you know, just a matter of the two hours that most of the assemblings take in order to give a presentation unto the Lord. Um, however that's defined, forgiveness is, is way deeper than that. And I want to give you a scripture reference, Old Testament, Old Covenant, that shows it from God's perspective. And it's important to understand that I, you know, I really bring out the fact that this is coming from the Old Covenant because in the way things are worded, we have to realize the audience that would be receiving this word. However, we can still take the lessons that were given to Israel and we can apply them today. So in the scripture that I'm getting ready to read, and I'm going to give it to you guys now, which is Isaiah 43, verses 22 through 25, um, we are literally talking about a whole chapter where the focus from God's perspective is redeeming man back to him. In this case, his chosen Israel back to him. And it's important to understand this because even in that word redeem, redeeming is just to be purchased. It's, it's like there's a price that has to be paid for disobedience, for sin. And God willfully paid that price that not us, but he gave the ultimate gift of redemption, forgiveness. I, I tell you, they're, they're kissing cousins. Mm -hmm. That we would have a hope that we could share in the glorious promise that he would have for us. And so again, while I'm reading this and you're going to hear references to Israel, know that with each line that I read, I'm going to actually talk about it, okay? Because I feel like we need to be clear on what's being said. And so starts out in verse 22 with, but you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have been weary of me, O Israel. So I want to stop right there for a moment because this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah and he's referring to Jacob, and Israel. And I found it very, very interesting that even though the actual Jacob, the uh, whose brother was Esau, we know that God dealt with him because everybody knows this. If you've been going to the assembly long enough that you know, we talk about it all the time where Jacob wrestled with God. Whatever that wrestling match looked like, okay, Jacob had to succumb to the fact that God is much mightier than he. But it was out of that struggle that God renamed Jacob Israel. And so... In this text, 
we're not talking so much about the man, but we're talking about the nature of the people who that man actually ended up leading. We, we read about it all the time. Was it Abraham, uh, uh, Isaac, Jacob? Is that how it goes? Yeah. So we read about these things all the time, but I want to put it into perspective because in the text here in Isaiah, He's referring, God that is, is referring to Jacob in the personality that is reflective, not only of the individual, but of the entire people. So think about it this way. Jacob the man is just an example of, of Jacob the nation, which becomes Israel, the nation, and it's all crazy enough. It's all defined in their names. So here we go. Jacob, what's the meaning of his name? It's one who is a supplanter, one who deceives, one, you know, slick. You know, this, we cannot take away that nature. This, and, 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 Israel, the people, have been a deceptive nation, deceptive before God, putting on airs of one thing, but their hearts are totally separated from God. That's deception, okay? But it all came out in the wrestling match with the individual because out of the wrestling match, a, cr a critical word came in, which is called humility. And in any kind of match, very seldom do they end in a tie. And with God, there's never a tie. And so God wins, of course. And it is us who has to then be changed. And so the same people who can be identified as being supplanters and deceivers and deceptive are the same people who by the name of Israel can define exactly what that name means, which means God prevails. God is, you could even say victorious. You cannot outlast, you can't out wrestle, you cannot outdo God. And so, it's always, you know, this, this tug of war between flesh and spirit. And that is all encompassed in Israel, the, 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 the people, all right? And I'm saying this because what's the takeaway for us that are not part of Israel is that, by golly, we do the same thing. We are almost like double agents. We come in saying one thing, but not necessarily living that thing. And if we're going to be talking about forgiveness, then forgiveness is about truth, not my truth, your truth, her truth, his truth, their truth, its truth, but the truth. And it's in the truth that we are made free. And so again, in Isaiah uh, 43, starting at 22 and 23, it says, but you have not called upon me, O Jacob, you deceiver, and you have been weary of me, O Israel, the one who will eventually let God prevail. But then in verse 23, uh, excuse me, then it says, you have not brought me the sheep of your burnt offerings. Now, the, you know, back in those times, an unblemished animal would have to be sacrificed for our sin. Even in the Garden of Eden, God had to take an innocent animal and strip that animal of its coat, his hair, his fur, 
and clothe both Adam and Eve because they were not only naked physically, but they were naked spiritually. They, they were exposed. They, they now understood the consequences and meaning behind good and evil. And they were overwhelmed, which is why they tried to hide themselves in vegetation. But vegetation could not offer the sacrifice. We would find that later in another sacrifice that would be made, uh, you know, uh, you know, with um, birthrights. That's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there has to be a death of something that is either animal and later we find out human mm -hmm. in order to be able to redeem, cover, pay back the cost of our misdoing. And what God is saying here is that, you know, oh Jacob, oh Israel, I have given you my very best. I have handpicked you out amongst a whole bunch of other people that by this time inhabited the earth. But it's you that I put my focus on. It's you that I've shared my law with. It's you that I've shared my heart with. And it's you that I've chastised and corrected. It's you that I have forgiven. And over and over and over and over again, you continue to despise me and to ignore me, to humiliate me, embarrass me, and disrespect me. And there are no other pretty words that I can put on that. That is how God receives our sin. We Gentiles, we don't get away from that either. Even though we didn't come in with the advantage of the law, the way our Jewish brethren did, we still came in under grace, and I would say even under grace, it's even more critical that we understand the gift of salvation, the gift of love, the gift of forgiveness, which is our word today. We have to understand it for what it is. And if we don't, we're no better than the ones who God chose from the very beginning. And so what is it for us today? Because we are no longer under the law. There's no longer innocent sheep or lamb or any other creature that has to be sacrificed like a, a, a calf, a, a bullock, as they were saying in the scriptures. We don't have that. We don't need that any longer because we who understand what God is doing here gave us the last and final sacrifice that we will ever need. And that sacrifice was Jesus Christ himself who willfully gave his life that we would have life and have this life more abundantly. You know, God is so good Guys, I'm, I'm telling you, even as I'm reading this, I don't even know how much, how far I'll get through all of this because this word forgiveness has so many layers that um, we don't want to just uh, give it, uh, you know, just a, a, a draft type or or a speed read type of of um, uh, um, sharing on this platform. So y'all bear with me for a moment because I'm doing a slow read, but I think by the time you get through it, you'll understand that um, this is a critical word for us as we relate to God and for us as we relate to each other. Suffice it to say, we become the living sacrifices as 
I believe uh, Romans 12 would have us be that um, we now almost like putting ourselves on the altar. Mm -hmm. Hey, Angel, we see you. God bless you. Not an altar that's going to have uh, charcoal and flames, but an altar that's even more uh, heated is the word I want to use because this is the altar of the Holy Spirit. Okay, my wife and I were having this conversation just the other day when we were talking about uh, the difference between a water baptism and a fire baptism. This is the fire baptism. Everybody can partake in the fire baptism because the fire is representative, is representative of the dross that was our old life mm -hmm. being burnt away. Okay, that what's underneath all of the muck and the mire, all of that is now dripping off of us that the pureness that God wanted us to be from, mm. the, from the original uh, creation of man himself can manifest itself. It's a process, but this receiving of his gift by us allowing ourselves to be put upon this spiritual altar. Burn me, oh God. Burn away my nastiness. Burn away my haughtiness. Burn away my uh, indiscretions. Burn away my sin nature. I'm tired, oh God, of disrespecting you, humiliating you, misrepresenting you. And now I'm laying myself upon this altar of sacrifice that you may do with me whatever needs to be done that I might be clean. Mm -hmm. The water part of that baptism is simply our public acknowledgement of what we should have already experienced through the fire of the Holy Spirit. Okay, but it makes sense here because when Paul is talking about becoming a living sacrifice, I don't even believe we understand that. Mm -hmm. That that that's everything that's within us. That's all of it. We we turn away from those things that have separated us from God and say, finally, oh God, oh God, oh God, I do not want to forsake you any longer. Oh God. I am the problem here. I'm not going to blame Satan. I'm not going to blame my friends and my enemies. I'm not going to blame anybody. The buck starts with me, oh God. Clean me up. Burn me, oh God. Purge me with the hyssop. The hyssop that is talked about can be an a agent that actually burns away infirmities. See, so we have to be in that state of mind saying, I I I've done it one way, it didn't work. I'm going God's way, I'm going your way, oh Lord. Amen. And now, I'm, whatever that means, I'm with you all the way, mm -hmm. even until the end of the world. So then in Isaiah 43, at verse 23 still, it says, Nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings. So I started to think, oh my goodness. Okay, so we went from burnt offerings to grain offerings. Now, back in those times, not only were uh, offerings of an uh, innocent animal given, but oftentimes a portion of one's flock or their, their harvest was also given as an offering. But when I think about it by today's terms, you know, the community is not going out there to necessarily uh, give 
a, a harvest of corn and you know other types of vegetables. But what is going on is that we talk about it all the time. We have our time and our talents and our treasures. Those are the things that we give up for the cause of Christ. Not to be money makers, not to be promoted as something that will obtain us favor or to glorify us, but to show God being glorified and people being edified. And we use our time, our talents, and our treasures, and we offer up to you, oh God, the sacrifices of what? Thanksgiving, being thankful. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of praise, 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 praise that comes through um, uh, all types of adversity, not just I'm on the praise team, I'm going to sing a song, but praise in which you actually went through something. You've been through the valley of the shadow of death, and now you don't fear any evil, for God is with you, and now you exclaim it to the mountaintops, God is glorious in this place, because that is coming from a true place of worship. And I know we're talking about forgiveness, but you can't talk about forgiveness without being prepared to be able to understand forgiveness and also give forgiveness and also receive forgiveness. That's why I'm taking my time with this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we use our time and our talents and our treasures. It's for God, not to make the audience happy, not to make mom and them happy. It's not about that at all. I mean, I was recently at a place and I had to tell them, I said, look here guys, I need to kind of decompress because I need to put, even though I'm sitting in front of you all, I need to put myself in an atmosphere where I'm in my own home. And it's just me and God and I'm just kicking it with him because that's as authentic as it gets. And I was really trying to tell them, this is not a performance. This is about showing and demonstration, demonstrating what worship could look like. And I'm not just saying that because it's music. I'm saying that with anything that we do. If you're a writer, do it to the glory of God through your pain, through your sacrifice. If you're an artist, you're one who paints or draws, do it to the glory of God. Everything that we do, if you are managing a business, still do it to the glory of God that your business is a model of how Christ has loved and has led the real church, the ecclesia. Do it in that manner and watch things pop off. For you, not because you wanted it to be for you, but because God is a God of reciprocity and he'll never let us outgive him. That's a fact, Jack. Okay, so as we continue um, in verse 24, I love this one. You have brought me no sweet cane with money. And I started to think, what in the world is this all about? And by golly, man, look at here. What that is talking about is this uh, element, this uh, ingredient that's called calamus. And calamus uh, was an anointing oil that was used for perfume or uh, for incense, and I'm starting now. I didn't. I didn't do a deep dive on this, y'all. So don't take this as a fact. But I'm starting to wonder if it was the same calamus that the uh, uh, woman who anointed Jesus, if that was the same, because 
of the expense because this stuff is very expensive. And I, I, you know, I, again, I always hear Myra in the things that she says, you know, when people around you are telling you it don't take all that, you know, why, why, why all that? Whether they're talking about your efforts or talking about the money that you use, then God has already revealed to you through the Holy Spirit. They're probably not of you because however God has inspired you to honor him, no matter what price tag it is, even if it's to our very lives, we pay that price. I'm, I'm going to just be straight, y'all. Um, one of the reasons why I really don't have much patience with people that are always complaining, uh, people that want to just wallow in, in pity parties, is because I don't think that they've cracked open their expensive bottle of oil in a spiritual sense. I'm not telling everybody to go out and buy some cologne or perfume. What I'm saying is that the most expensive uh, offering that we can give is ourselves. And if we haven't allowed ourselves to be broken open and exposed, then God has yet to experience our fragrance in the manner in which he deserves. You guys... Stop looking at this stuff from a natural eye. Look at it from, that's why I'm trying to give it to you from God's perspective to the best of my ability with my limited resources, basically my brain. But I'm trying to imagine, you can't give God anything that he didn't already own. And even when we give ourselves, he already owns us. He made us. Yet, because he gave us an opportunity to choose him, and we actually do choose him, which means we stop choosing ourselves, it's literally like cracking open the alabaster box and letting the fragrance of our worship, of our obedience, of our praise pour all over our Lord. And if we had hair long enough, men, we'd wipe those things away with our tears. <laughs> I just, I'm trying to give y'all an image here because this is what this is all about. And forgiveness, this is what love is all about. And we don't really deal with it on that level. Men, if somebody says one little thing that that uh, uh, turns us up, you know, that... that uh, 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 bothers us then we're just all twisted and all out of been out of shape and i'm like what really it that's all it takes for you to one little comment which could be a horrible one i'm not gonna lie to you could be horrible but it's one and maybe that individual in their whole lifetime gave you 500 great comments and the one thing and that's the one you're gonna remember <laughs> okay don't get me started. Um, I'm basing this some off, off of, of actual experience here. Nevertheless, we guys become the fragrance. That's what I'm trying to say. Let us be the anointing oil that our brokenness becomes the flavor of the hour. The sweet, sweet aroma of the atmosphere. And I'm going to tell you, you will never have to worry about God meeting you right where you are. Uh, this, you're not going to get this from the pulpit. I'm telling you. So this is why you need to uh, keep with us. So I'm going to press on um, because it gets even better than that. Because it says still in Isaiah 43, I'm at now uh, verse, I'm still in verse 24. It says then, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Now guys, this is where I've got to really tell you my story. Anybody who knows me knows that I am a carnivore. There ain't a piece of meat that I'm not ready to grill, fry. Well, I don't fry too much these days. Uh, but broil, bake, 
Boil, I'm telling you, I'm going to have it. And here's the thing. It used to always get to me that God seemed to not only require the animal sacrifice, but he specifically focused on the fat <laughs> from that animal. Like that was even more precious than the carcass, right? And it made me think, because guys, I love to cook. And in cooking, the worst thing that you can do is pull off the fat and the skin, at least not before you've done the cooking. Now, you might pull it off afterwards if that's your flavor. But guys, let me tell you, when you got that steak and butter sauce, going in your skillet and you got it on high heat you know basically three and a half minutes each side that's my flavor because i like it medium rare all right the what are you doing you are literally taking not only the butter and you gotta be butter y'all gotta be butter you're not only taking the butter and laying that butter over the top of that meat. But within that butter is the juices that came off the fat. And that is where the flavor is. If you take that away, you just got a piece of meat. But the flavor is in that fat. All right? And you don't have to be like me because I'm going to tell you I'm going to eat the fat too. But if you keep removing that stuff, you're not getting the full abundance of what that meat can do for you as far as satisfying your belly. And I'm telling you, I thought about this when it comes to us, because again, I'm just taking my natural love for cooking and then I'm putting it on us. If we are on the altar of sacrifice, God does not want us to trim away the fat. He wants all of us because it's in that substance that we don't think is that important. That's really the essence of who we are. And if we don't offer that along with the carcass, we have not fully given our whole selves to him. Let me tell y'all guys something. You can get the leanest cut of meat. It'll probably say something like this, 98% fat free. I get you, but it's still 2% in there because they won't even sell it. I'm telling you, they won't even sell it. In fact, it is impossible to take out all fat. And that's in anything. I don't care if they say fat free. I'm talking about even to the milks and all this kind of stuff because fat is a natural part of any animal product. And you can't just separate it like the wheat and the chaff. It doesn't work that way. It, it, it liquefies, it's, it, it's uh, what is it, like, like a, um, sometimes like a, even a gelatin. You, you, it's just hard to get away from it. If you've ever looked at, at a, a piece of chicken, even within the layers of the meat, you'll see little portions of fat in there. And you will be spending like three or four hours trying to pluck all that out. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to end up with a dry piece of meat. That's what you're going to end up with. So God is saying to us, I want it all. I want everything, everything. There's nothing that, uh, is, that I'm going to turn away if you're giving everything to me. And when you do that, then guess what? I in return will give all back to you. But here comes the 
the, the hard part in Isaiah 43. It says, But you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Now can you imagine a holy God, a holy righteous God, you know what he just said there? He's basically said, but you broke my heart. Which I think is a hard thing to do for Almighty God. Which means that at the core, God has already exposed that his heart is very tender. And we take advantage of that because, again, we're in this all about me ministry. We're in its me, myself, and I ministry. It's all about what have you done for me lately ministry. It's, it's committing oneself to an obligation and only asking what can you do for me and not saying what we like to say all the time, what shall I render to Jehovah? For he has done so very much for me. There's always something that has to be returned. Even in forgiveness, there is a return that's expected. Will it be from everyone? Absolutely not. But God himself, who gave us Jesus Christ, gave us his forgiveness statement in John 3.16. And yet understanding this, knowing that most would reject that verse and continue to go on and live according to their daddy, the father of lies, Satan, and forsake. And let me say this, guys. The, to forsake the real assembly has nothing to do with whether you go to church on a Sunday morning. Forsaking the assembly is forsaking God and God's people. Whether you meet in the park, on a mountaintop, on a hill, in the valley. If you just say, I'm just going to be uh, Lone Wolf McQuaid and just go out there and just live on the, on the earth by myself, with myself. For myself, that's forsaking the ecclesia. If you don't see me in your building, doesn't mean I, I've forsaken anyone. Okay, forsaking means that I've turned away from the love of God. I've turned away from his act of forgiveness. And I've decided I want to party with the world. I'm going to be part of the world. I don't know how many times I can express it. I don't know how many ways I can express it. But we took, put too much value in stuff that's superficial. And we forget that we need to have an honest and raw and relational experience with God our Father. And when I thought about this, listen to what God is saying. You have burdened me with your sins and I'm weary that you guys keep coming back to me with your iniquities. He's saying, I've had it, y'all. I'm tired of this. This is the same thing. We're just going in rotation, back and forth, back and forth. You fall short, I forgive. You fall short again, I forgive. You fall short again, I forgive. And we've got to get off of this cycle in order for something new to happen. That's why Jesus came. That we would have a new cycle. That wasn't depending on us trying to live the perfect life according to the law. Because the law has no grace in it, y'all. Do you not understand that? There's no grace in the law. That's why I always say we deserve to be dead now destroyed because there's no grace in the law it's a set of rules by God's standards which are perfect that no man could ever live 
So God, understanding this all along, finally gives us the opportunity through Jesus Christ to then be able to say, I'm guilty, oh God, save me. And he does it willfully. Even when Jesus himself said, must I drink, excuse me, bear this burden? Must I bear this burden? He turns right around and says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. God is giving us a reflection of how we have to be even today. It's still not our will. We gave up our will when we accepted him. It's his will be done. Which means we got to put up with a whole lot of stuff. It means that sometimes people are not going to love you. And if you go in my territory, a lot more people will not love you. Nevertheless, they don't hate me. They hate the God that is directing me. So as I, I, I thought I was going to go other places, I don't think I'm going to have a t enough time to do that because I'm already uh, at usually my stopping point. But listen to this. This I'm going to read. And actually, I, I stole this because it was so well written that I just didn't want to even change it. And this is actually coming from a note that I read in Bible Hub. Okay. It said, God is tired of observing the worship practices of his people while their hearts are estranged from him. For a good uh, scripture reference for that, go to Isaiah 114. He uses harsh language saying that his soul hates their observances and other law required feasts. For us today, it's holidays. We'll get to that in another lesson. All right. Um, it's not that God did not want them to obey the requirements of the law for those things. Obedience to the law has no meaning if their hearts are, uh, are or were hard and their daily lifestyles were continually sinful. He finds their acts of worship to be a burden for him because their hearts and minds are not for him. Instead of receiving the praises of his people with joy, he is tired of carrying them because they are false and they are dead weight. The last thing that we want is for our perceived worship to be received by God as dead weight. And because he knows the heart, me and Myra, we don't have to sit and judge who's being authentic or not. God knows. And, you know, he's basically saying, I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired of this. I want something that's authentic. I want something that's real. I'm going to be honest with you again. Person that's not willing to share their story. I, don't, I, I can't believe in their authenticity because we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. It's in the Bible. And, and, and so our story is not about us. It's about how we can help others, how things that have gone on in our lives are relatable to other people. And they cannot be ashamed because people that they might perceive, in this case, it might be Myra and me, they think that, oh man, they got it all together now. 
But we can tell them, huh, not so. Even today, we still have to work out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling. It never ends in this life. But praise be unto God through forgiveness. What did Jesus say on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Have you ever thought about who he was addressing? You think that he was only addressing the people in the vicinity of Golgotha Hill? Maybe he was talking just to the Roman soldiers who were just carrying out their orders like good soldiers? Do you think he was talking about those disciples who you couldn't even find? Do you think they were talking about Judas the betrayer? Do you think they're talking about the people that cried out for Barabbas? Do you think they're talking about the Jewish council that said, you know what? We don't want anything but Jesus to die. No, he was talking about everything, all of us. He was already into the future, into eternity, talking about all who would not accept him. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He was still pleading forgiveness for those who would reject him. If Jesus did that, how much more are we required to do those things for each other? Do y'all understand why this is so critical and why my voice is 10 times higher? Because it doesn't seem like these lessons ever sink in. We keep looking at everything from our perspective and God is saying, look at it through my perspective because my perspective is the only perspective that counts. My perspective is the only one that's going to lead you to everlasting life in eternity with me. Everything that God has done is based in love and in forgiveness. He's put out a blanket statement. I'm forgiving the people that haven't even been born yet. Do y'all get it? I died for y'all. Y'all not even here yet, but I died for you. <laughs> Again, you know I got to go there. That's why you can't have abortions. You just can't. You don't know what's at stake. You don't know God's plan because you say, this is my body. No, it's God's body. We don't own this. God does. And so, <laughs> gosh, lastly, lastly, I got to read it. Matthew 18. I think Myra was in Matthew 18 a, a little bit yeah. earlier. Matthew 18. This I am going to read all the way through and then I'm done. Um, verses 21 through 35. This is the story. This is the one I want you guys to meditate on because uh, it matters. It really does. It, it starts with, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? So right there, Myra, Myra made this point as well. Peter was looking at it from a Jewish legalistic perspective. That's what he's doing. Uh, seven. You know, we got to put a number on it. So isn't it something? We all got to put a number on something, right? Uh, <laughs> but Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, which I think is humorous because <laughs> if you do the math, the math is just crazy. It basically speaks to this, this number that really means infinity by, by, by uh, uh, spiritual context. But it, it equates to that, um, you know, the 144,000 that are supposed to, you know, 
these are just random numbers to show that there's going to be a multitude. Okay, those numbers aren't literal. And so Jesus hit Peter back with spirit while Peter was being legalistic. Okay, <laughs> then he says, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he had begun to settle accounts. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and get this, forgave him the debt. Okay, when you forgive the debt, Myra, help me understand that. There's no payment required. Nothing. Nothing. It's not, okay, we're going to put you on a payment plan. We got you, we got you on layaway. <laughs> no. Forgave the debt. Okay, but then it says, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. He was worse than the first master. But he said, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Look, I'm going to stop there for a minute because how in the world are you going to pay the debt when you're in prison? Have y'all thought about that? Okay. <laughs> anyway, so he says, so when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and they came and told their master all that had been done then his master after he had called him said to him you wicked servant i forgave you all your debt because you begged me should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as i had pity on you and his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And again, I say, how can he pay back when he's spending his whole time in torture? <laughs> so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. What are we saying as we close out? We are simply saying, God is that original master. He's the original master. We came to him saying, forgive us, God, we messed up. <laughs> and we know that we should be paying with our lives. There's a debt that we can't possibly repay, but God had compassion on us through Jesus Christ to forgive us of our debts. We read it in Matthew 6. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And, and, and so what do we do? We're like the one that got that forgiveness. And then we turn around and yoke people up. Look, I'm taking my little uh, my little uh, microphone here and I'm pretending that's a head. I'm just grabbing it by the neck. And I'm saying, you owe me, you piece of blank, 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 blank. Because I 
did not uh, exercise what my father in heaven has exercised and that is compassion guys we got to love each other mm -hmm. we have got to love each other even when it hurts us to love each other because there are consequences that we cannot see in the natural. But all of these things lead up to how we are judged in those final days. And I think one of the reasons why Myra and I focus our lives outside of doing these uh, Facebook lives, everything that we do is about helping people. And I think that's because we understand how greatly we have been helped and have been shown mercy. Mm -hmm. And in that same manner, we want to show it back to uh, people through Christ and through giving and through trying to show people how to take care of themselves. And, and that's really the whole thing. And even what we're doing right now, um, uh, I don't even know who's with us at the moment, but but all of this is that even if you're not with us live, that you can pick it up later and you can just get something from the things that we're saying. Because for me and Myra, uh, this is part of our sacrifice. We, we spend our time uh, entertaining questions and words and whatever other subject matter we come up with. And we present it to you in a manner that we pray is glorifying God. Uh, we're not looking for, um, you know, mass uh, social media presence. We're looking for honesty and truth. And we pray that we've delivered that today. Uh, my dear, do you have anything else you want to say to that? No. All right. Well, with that said, God bless you. God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus Christ. God bless you. Amen. Amen.